the next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Ofer Ajid, and Ofer comes from um, the uh, KMH in, in, in Toronto. He's the medical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Toronto, and he's a staff psychiatrist at the first episode program there, and the leader of the home intervention uh, of, for the psychosis team at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. It's a, it's a unique program that combines both moving into the city, uh, moving into the, the um, uh, residents of people and treating them there uh, for their first episode psychosis. Uh, Ofer is really well known for the work he's been doing here. They've been developing a, a really good database, which they've, they've been utilizing quite well to help clinical uh, clinicians deal with very complex clinical problems, but particularly very useful for the people who are in the, uh, the first episode programs. He's uh, joined the schizophrenia program and the PET Center at the uh, University of Toronto as a clinical fellow in 2001. During his fellowship, he was involved in conducting research studies in the field of psychopharmacology in order to discover how antipsychotic medications uh, are, affect the different domains of symptomatology in, in patients with schizophrenia. Uh, Dr. Ajid is a main research interests have been deciphering the early response to antipsychotic medications, investigating uh, early predictors of response, and looking at uh, the kinds of response we're seeing in, in early psychosis in particular. He's the recipient of grants, and he's presented his research at major, major meetings and conferences, and we're very fortunate to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ofer Ajid. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me here. My name is Ofer Ajid. I know it's a funny name, but I didn't pick it up. And I will talk about algorithm-based treatment for first episode schizophrenia. This is my disclosure slide. And you know, whenever I'm talking about treatment for schizophrenia, in order to keep things in perspective, I like to take a couple of minutes and to mention some past treatments for schizophrenia. Artificial hibernation was a very popular treatment, uh, insulin coma. Bathing therapy, usually with ice. See, the nurse was standing there to make sure that the patients are adherent with the treatment. So adherence was important even then. And uh, frontal lobotomy. Frontal lobotomy was a hit, considered to be very elegant, almost side effect free. A metal probe was put in the eye socket of the patient. And no brain imaging these days, so according to the mood or the time the neurosurgeon had, he simply destroyed the frontal lobes of the patients. Considered to be very popular, very elegant treatment. So popular that the guy who invented it got the Nobel Prize in medicine not so long ago, 1949, Igas Monit, for his discovery of the therapeutic value of frontal lobotomy in psychosis. By the way, he was shot by one of his patients. But I don't know if before or after the frontal lobotomy. <laughs> the revolution came with these three guys. Early 50s, Paris, France. Henry Laboury was a French anesthesiologist. He discovered this molecule. There are at least three versions for the story how Delay and Deniker found that this molecule, chlorpromazine, is good for antipsychotic action. But whatever the version of the story is, in 1952, they published the first publication, first report of antipsychotic treatment. First time, a, a, a report regarding the antipsychotic action, the antipsychotic action of a compound uh, please note that they said there in their first report that it, this antipsychotic action, onset of this antipsychotic compound, happens within days after administer this medication. Nobody knew how this antipsychotic works. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of works were published regarding the mechanism of action of antipsychotics up until Arvid Carlson, 1963, published this paper saying that probably antipsychotic action is related to dopamine antagonism. So here you go, another Nobel Prize, Arvid Carlson, the year 2000, maybe a more legitimate quote-unquote Nobel Prize, Arvid Carlson and his work on dopamine. Now, schizophrenia is a dynamic disorder, and very early during the course of illness, we see some neuropathological changes 
happen in the brain of the patient. And the question that we should ask ourselves is, is it preventable? Can we prevent it? These neuropathological changes, for example, gray matter loss in these patients, happen very early during the course of illness and is correlated, for example, to the cognitive impairment. So percentage, for example, of changes in the gray matter or in the white matter of the brain are related to how the patient is doing cognitively wise. And the question is that we should ask ourselves, is early and effective treatment can prevent these changes from happening? <clears throat> so there is no clear answer, but we get some hints. For example, in this study or set of studies, those, those neuropathological changes are correlated to the BPRS, one of the, our most commonly used rating scale to measure psychosis. So these neuropathological changes are correlated with the clinical status of the patient. So if hypothetically we can make this clinical status of the patient better, can we prevent these neuropathological from happening? Is it at all preventable? In this part of the slide, you can see that the time of, of, of the patient hospitalized is correlated to some extent to these neuropathological changes. So again, the same question. Can we prevent it from happening by treating the patient? And of course, the story of duration of untreated psychosis. Again, so there are some reports claiming that there is relationship between duration of untreated psychosis and the clinical outcome afterwards. So I know there are always anecdotal data, it's not always true, and so on and so forth, but there are some meta-analytic studies, there are some reports that shows that there is association between the duration of untreated psychosis and the outcome. For example, in first episode schizophrenia. And again, the same question that should bothers us. Can we do something better for our patients in treating them as early as possible, as effective as possible, in order to prevent those neuropathological changes in order to uh, make outcome better? So whatever, you know, there is still ongoing debate about the neuroprotection property of antipsychotics. Nobody really knows, and again, it's an open question. But definitely, with early and effective treatment, we can probably prevent suicide and relapse, hospitalization, incarceration, homelessness, maybe even those neurological, uh, uh, neuropathological changes in the brain and maybe prevent this vicious cycle of deterioration for our first episode patients. So we in Toronto tried to put together an algorithm, an algorithm for first episode patients with schizophrenia in order to optimize the treatment that we give to our patients as early as possible, give them the most effective treatment as early as possible. Why algorithm? What is an algorithm? Algorithm is a decision tree for medication management. We have guidelines for therapy linked to information on number of parameters. We are talking about algorithm that progress according to rating scales, i.e. according to the response of the patient. And the rules of the algorithm usually derive, definitely in our case, through expert opinion and consensus. Now, algorithm is not a guideline. Guideline is much broader. You know, we can say that the guideline for treating schizophrenia say that we have to give the patient antipsychotic medications. But algorithms are more specific. They will try to identify the good responders, to identify the partial responders, to identify the non-responders as early as possible in order to optimize their treatment. So there are many advantages of treatment algorithms. 
There are treatment algorithms not only in psychiatry, all over medicine we can see them. We are talking about standardized treatment. We are talking about improved clinical decision making, support treatment decision. It reduces potential for errors, especially if a large group adopt an algorithm. It allows a timely selection, and I will get back to it later, a timely selection of the best treatment. And again, as I said, it's based on evidence-based, consensus, expert, and moreover, it addressed practical issue, not addressed by clinical trial data. There are many algorithms, for example, in medicine, for example, in cancer we can find algorithms, in pulmonary artery hypertension, type 2 diabetes, chronic hepatitis. Many fields of medicine adopted algorithms, and maybe it's about time that we as psychiatrists dealing with schizophrenia will think about the standardized treatment because of all its advantages. What are the basic assumptions that we had when we put together, when we built up the algorithm for first episode patient with schizophrenia? The first, as I said before, is the importance of early and effective treatment. So this is, we all know this illustration, this is the famous Jeff Lieberman illustration, illustrate the first 50, 60 years of a patient with schizophrenia. We currently think that the patient is probably born with schizophrenia. We have the prodromal symptoms, very difficult to tease apart from normal quote-unquote teenager behavior. And then we have the first break, first psychotic break. And the question is what happens afterwards? Is this deterioration that we see is inevitable? And maybe we can say that there are two schools here. We can call them the pessimistic and optimistic. The optimistic will say, you know, if we will optimize treatment here, we have this window of opportunity to make outcome better, and there is no inev inevitable downhill trajectory. The pessimistic school would say, you know, whatever you will do, there will be this inevitable downhill trajectory and you are actually wasting our time. I'm proud to say that our group is part of the optimistic uh, 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 people that say that maybe, hypothetically, we can optimize treatment as early as possible, find the most effective treatment for patients and maybe, hypothetically, influence outcomes. The second assumption that we use, and it's very important when we were talking about timelines of treatment, is the story of an onset of action of antipsychotics. This is very important because this will lead us to identify those non-responders as early as possible during the course of treatment. Because one of the problems, you know, if we would have hypothetically an antipsychotic medication that 100% of the patient will respond to, so we don't need an algorithm. However, we all know that a subgroup of our patients, a subset of our patients, are not responding well to the medications. And we should switch or go to clozapine, or do something about it. And the question is, how long should we wait? But the question that we should ask before is, what's the onset of action of antipsychotics? Because up until, I would say, a decade ago, there was this famous clinical wisdom about the delayed onset of action of antipsychotics. Antipsychotics are working only after three, or four, or five weeks. In the first weeks, we only see placebo effect or non-specific effect, but the antipsychotic action takes time to appear. So what is the onset of action of antipsychotics? So we conducted a meta-analytic study in order to ask this question. Why we were so bothered by it? Because our understanding the D2 receptor blockade are central to antipsychotic action. So I can continue arguing with Herb Meltzer. 
if D2 is the most critical receptor. However, there is no argument that D2 receptor blockade is a critical action, critical mechanism that should happen for the antipsychotic action. Now we know, based on our PET studies, that when we give an antipsychotic medication to the patient, within hours, we get dopamine D2 receptor blockade. So in a way, we have a paradox here. So the onset of action hypothetically should happen within the first hours if we can block dopamine D2 receptors within the first hours. So we conducted a meta-analytic study. We actually took all the English published literature that were published over more than 30 years. And we tried to, and we had more than 7,000 patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorder diagnosis. And we tried to accumulate and to find the bottom line, the time response curve that will, that will summarize all the time response curve from all those studies. And this is what we got. During the first four weeks of treatment, response happens. Actually, during the first week of treatment, we can see most of the antipsychotic response. However, one can argue that here we used BPRS and PAN's total scores. So let's first take the same analysis and remove the placebo effect. Same illustration. Still. Early onset of action, within the first week or two, we still see, we can see the antipsychotic action, if there is an antipsychotic action. Now, again, my, my, one can argue, wait a minute, when you are looking at the total score of BPRS and PANS, you include the milieu effect and sedation and agitation and influence of, uh, on the level of anxiety and so on and so forth. So let's look of what happening with this time response curve, during the first weeks of treatment, only with the influence on the core psychotic symptoms. Same illustration. No delayed onset of action of antipsychotics. Within the first weeks, we can see the action. Again, if there is an action, and let's remove placebo, effect from these core psychotic symptoms, and we will get, again, the same story. And the story is as follows. Within the first week, we see separation from placebo in the antipsychotic action of these medications. By the way, exactly like Delay and Deniker described in 1952 in their first report about antipsychotic action that they can see the antipsychotic action with chlorpromazine after three days. Less delusions, less hallucinations, and so on and so forth. So how does this early improvement evolve over weeks and months? So here is another meta-analytic study, this time for a year. More than 700 patients. So here you can see it's a little bit difficult to see the different colors is different ways to deal with dropout. But here we can see the first year of treatment. The first four columns are the first four weeks. So what can we see here? A, no delayed onset of action of antipsychotics. On the contrary, there is early onset of action of antipsychotic, but moreover, if we will look at the response over the first year of treatment, we can see that most of the treatment happens during the first four weeks. And one can argue, so if someone is not responding after four weeks of treatment, should we wait? or do something about it. So if response is not delayed, how early it is? We try to uh, answer this question with two studies. We analyzed the, the results of two studies. One is with Ziprazidone, IM. We try to measure what happened to the patient during the first day of treatment with the anti, what happens antipsychotic uh, uh, symptoms wise. We compare here, or we analyze this data, but the, the medications that were compared that 
was the prazidone in an active dose versus the prazidone in a sham dose, i.e. it was like placebo, we could see difference in the antipsychotic action within 24 hours. And here is another study that we analyzed the data. More than 300 patients. We have three different groups of patients. One was placebo, haloperidol, or lanzapine. The patients got everything I am, and again, the same picture. Within the first day, we could see separation from placebo. Within the first day, we could see the onset of action of antipsychotic happening. And this is true for other medications as well. Seroquel, aripiprazole, ziprazidone, there is no delayed onset of action. If there is an action, you can see it within the first weeks of treatment, the separation from placebo. So maybe hypothetically, the onset of action of antipsychotics is very early, and if there is no action, there is no delayed action, but simply no action, and we shouldn't wait. Moreover, when we look at recent published studies, we can see that we can separate early responders from early non-responders very early during the course of treatment. So early responders will continue to be good responders, in this case, six months down the road, and early non-responders, after two weeks of treatment, follow the same trajectory of partial response. And we replicate the data recently, and it was published last month in, psycho, in European Psychopharmacology. And what we showed there is after two weeks, we can actually separate between responders to non-responders, and it correlates how do they do down the road, six months down the road, functioning-wise. So in a way, early responders predict later response. And sorry, early response predict later response. Early non-response predicted later non-response. So if hypothetically we try to build up an algorithm here and we think about timelines, so very early, within weeks or months, and in a minute I'll go into specifications regarding the timelines, we can identify or I would say find those non-responders that respond differently to antipsychotics. And again, let's go back to the algorithm. Let's try to put it together right now here. What do we do in case of no response? For example, a patient will take two lines, will exhaust two lines of antipsychotics, will wait enough time, which is definitely not a lot of time, but he's still non-responder. What are the options? These are the most commonly used options. Polypharmacy, switching between non-clozapine antipsychotics, increase the duration of trial, meaning simply wait, dose increase, and of course, clozapine. Let's talk about polypharmacy. Should we use polypharmacy? I'm talking now about polypharmacy, non-clozapine polypharmacy. So polypharmacy in order to increase efficacy in case of non-response. Combination between first generation or second generation antipsychotic in order to increase response. This is a recent meta-analytic study. Polypharmacy as a method to increase efficacy. This meta-analytic study, again, I'm not talking about clozapine add-on or add-on to clozapine. This uh, meta-analytic study looked at first generation versus first generation plus first generation and add-on of second generation to first generation and add-on on of uh, uh, first generation to second generation and add-on of second generation to second generation and so on and so forth. All the possible combination. The bottom line is very simple. There is no added efficacy to polypharmacy based on the literature. Beside one Chinese study, one Chinese study that found different uh, 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 data, there is no added efficacy of this combined treatment. But there is increased side effects. When we combine treatment, 
for these patients who are not responding, we can get more prevalence for different side effects, weight gain, diabetes, premorbid, a, a pre a, a metabolic syndrome, drug-drug interaction, cost, and so on and so forth, but no added efficacy. So what else do we have there? Should we wait? Should we increase the dose? Polypharmacy, what about clozapine? So clozapine is very interesting. It was drawn because of the risk of agranulocytosis in the 70s and then was established as superior to other antipsychotics in the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the, in the 80s. This rapid withdrawal of clozapine led to rapid relapse with severe symptoms. And Dr. Herb Meltzer published this article showing that clozapine is better for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And actually, correct me if I'm wrong here, but clozapine is the only medication that is approved for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Let's go back to the algorithm. We try to put together an algorithm that will treat the patient with the most effective treatment as early as possible. So this is the algorithm that we use, very straightforward algorithm, we use two second-generation antipsychotics with different doses. We start with low dose, medium dose, high dose. The algorithm, the patient progress according to response, according to rating scale. We have certain definition in a minute I'll show you for what is response, what's non-response, and so on and so forth. If the patient is not responding to one line, of treatment, first line of treatment, we switch to a second line of treatment, and if again there is no response, we go to clozapine. These are the rules of our algorithm, so we found some cutoff points based on expert consensus. We found the definition for response, and what is partial response, and what is non-response. The most important thing that the patient should be rated with rating scale continuously, as part of the clinical routine in order to see if the patient are responding or not, and if we can still optimize the treatment in case of no response or partial response. Regarding the, the rating scale or how we rate the patient, I'll just summarize it briefly. We are using two different sets of scales to measure response. The first one is relative response, and then down the road, after four months, for example, we use absolute response, and let me explain. During the first weeks of treatment, we're using relative response scales, for example, CGI, clinical global impression. We want to see how the patient is doing compared to baseline. If the patient is not doing well, we will move forward. If the patient is doing well, that's wonderful, but not enough, because four months down the road, we will use absolute response. We will use a different set of rating scales, for example, Andreas on remission criteria or CGIS severity. The reason why is because a patient can, bet, can get much, much better during the first weeks of treatment, but still be very sick. So we are using this combined approach approach, relative response during the first weeks, and then absolute response three, four months down the road. And we don't want our patients to be stable. We actually don't like this word. We want them to be remitted. You know, stable patients for me are patients that there is still work to do with them. They're still psychotic. They are stable because they are much better compared to baseline. You know, I had a father of one of my patients. He, said, he told me once over the phone, good news, doctor, much improved. He attacked me only twice this week. We don't want our patients to be stable. We want them to achieve remission. We want to push the patient to, to, to try to give the most effective treatment as early as possible and to eliminate all the psychotic symptoms as much as we can, as much as we can. This is a recent publication that summarized our preliminary results from around eight years, first eight years of our algorithm. More than 300 patients were participating. 
offer this algorithm. We used, because this is what was available back then, we used olanzapine and risperidone, mostly olanzapine and risperidone. In other words, patient came from the door, through the door to our clinic, first episode day clinic. We offered them olanzapine. We waited, again, relative response, absolute response. If there was no response to olanzapine, we switched to risperidone and vice versa. We offered them risperidone. If there is no a, a response to risperidone, we switch to olanzapine. And if there is no response to both of them, we went to clozapine. And this is our preliminary results. Let me walk you through the results. Trial one, meaning first trial of antipsychotic medication for a patient with olanzapine or risperidone. Around 75% of our patients responded. This is something well known. Surprisingly, first episode schizophrenia is a highly treatable disease. 75% of our patients respond favorably to olanzapine or risperidone. However, 25% did not respond to the first line of treatment. These guys were switched to olanzapine or to risperidone. And for this subgroup of patients, response for the second line of treatment was very, very small. The non-responders for this second line of treatment were switched to clozapine and the response was robust. Again, 75% response. The question that we should ask when we see this illustration is, do we need a second line of treatment at all or should we go directly to clozapine if we will identify those non-responders early enough? By the way, we found differences, a signal different between olanzapine and risperidone. Patients who were treating with risperidone and didn't respond, responded to olanzapine in relatively higher percentages. Patients who did not respond to olanzapine rarely respond to a, a risperidone. In a way, if I want to be a little bit provocative here, I would say that maybe hypothetically, if someone is not responding to olanzapine first line, the chances of responding to a non-clozapine medication is very, very low. And both groups responded in robustly to clozapine. Here is another way to look of, at, at our data, and this will answer some questions that I asked before. This is the data from a different perspective. This is the first six months of treatment. In our algorithm, we offered clozapine after six months of treatment. So we took the patients around three months to exhaust risperidone, three months to go through olanzapine. After six months, these patients here were non-responders. We offered them clozapine. Some refused, mainly because of blood work, and some agreed, accepted. These are, these are the patients who accepted clozapine. So after six months when we introduce clozapine, we see improvement in their symptoms. The patient who stayed on the same treatment did not respond. So in a way, this is, I would say, a partial answer that to, to the question, should we wait longer? Should we give them more time? Well, probably not, because they are not going to get more, uh, uh, not going to get better. Now let's look at this bothering, I would say, if clozapine is so good, still we have 75% responders, but 25% non-responder. And I'm again quoting uh, Dr. Meltzer here, there is not much to do to these patients who are non-responder to clozapine. However, I would like to ask this question about non-response to clozapine from a different perspective. What do we know? What do we know about the dose of clozapine? Can we optimize clozapine dose-wise? What do we know about the dose? You know, those 25% of non-responders to clozapine that, again, uh, we see them all over the world with different uh, trials. What about the dose? You know, it's interesting. The story of the dose of clozapine is very interesting. 
This is, I took it from the CPS. We all know the CPS. In the CPS, there is warning. And this is, by the way, the only antipsychotics that have this kind of warning. Let me show the warning, CPS 2011 warning under the subtitle of doses to clozapine. The maximum dose of 900 milligrams a day should never be exceeded. Never. Okay, CPS 2012, surprisingly, the maximum dose of 900 should not be uh, uh, exceeded. I don't know who is responsible for the wording. Surprisingly, they change it. But let me be the devil's advocate and ask, why 900? Based on what? So we, we recently published, actually last month in Psychopharmacology, a, a, an answer, a partial answer to a, a, this question were from this 900, or, and the flip side of this question is, is it possible that we can increase the dose and get more response to clozapine? Is it at all possible? You know, people will come with the famous clinical wisdom, oh, God forbid, no, there is toxicity. So let's talk a little bit about toxicity. Okay, so what do we know about clozapine levels? We try to uh, uh, conduct this meta-analytics, our anal analysis. We try to look about what do we know, what the literature know about the upper limit threshold and the lower limit threshold of clozapine level. And surprisingly, I must say that there is not much information in the literature, so the question is still open. And again, this was published last month with psychopharmacology. We found different things. For example, the relationship between the dose and the plasma level are not clear. Plasma level and safety-related side effects, no, surprisingly, no evidence in the literature. So there is evidence that when we go beyond 500, 600 milligrams dose, I'm talking about the dose of clozapine, we increase the risk for seizures. But what is it to do with plasma levels? There is no one single evidence in the literature about the upper threshold, so that plasma levels are related to safety, safety-related side effects. Uh, um, there is clear evidence indicated that dose-related increased risk. By the way, in our clinic, we routinely use anti-epileptic medications in case of uh, increasing clozapine beyond 500 or 600 because of this uh, data. But there is a lack of data to suggest relationship of plasma level of clozapine and side effects linked to safety. So the current safety-related threshold is not supported by evidence, but instead arose from reviews based on few case reports. So what to do with these plasma levels? The plasma levels traditionally test for toxicity, but the plasma levels show no relationship to safety related side effect. So in a way, we can test plasma level to ensure that the lower therapeutic threshold has been reached, that we are not giving too little clozapine, but maybe hypothetically we can increase the dose because based on the literature, based on the literature, we don't know what's the upper dose of clozapine. And maybe hypothetically, that some patients will respond to higher doses of clozapine. And you know, we must remember that this subgroup of patients who are non-responders to clozapine, this is a huge problem because we really don't have anything to offer them. So maybe this can change the life for minority of them. We can call this subgroup, subset of patients with different names. We can call them refractory schizophrenia, treatment resistant, treatment refractory. Dr. Meltzer just saw us different definition. Is it possible that we are talking about separate entity here? Is it possible that these treatment resistant schizophrenia are a group that only clozapine will work for them? And maybe hypothetically, it will be almost a waste of time to try non-clozapine medications for them. How early we can identify them. And 
maybe the position of clozapine should be totally different. Is treatment resistant schizophrenia a separate entity? Let me introduce you this study. It was published last year in the American Journal of Psychiatry. First study of its kind, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, brain imaging study. It measured striatal dopamine synthesis capacity, in other words, activity of dopamine in the striatum in three groups. Healthy volunteers, treatment responders, patient with schizophrenia responded to treatment, and patient with schizophrenia who are treatment resistant, not clozapine patients. Patients that simply took antipsychotic medications, two, or at least three, two or three, and did not respond. And let's see the results in this brain imaging study. Healthy volunteer, this was the level of dopamine activity, again, dopamine synthesis activity in the striatum. Uh, this was the level for the healthy volunteers. The next group was treatment responders. Patients with schizophrenia responded to treatment. As expected, I would say, level of dopamine was higher. Dopamine synthesis capacity was higher. What about the patient with treatment resistant? schizophrenia. Patients who try different antipsychotic and did not respond. What about their dopamine level? The same as healthy controls. Are we talking here about a separate entity? So you know, it's a small study, almost anecdotal study, and so on and so forth, but we get here a hint that maybe, hypothetically, we are talking about a different subset of patients, even from the biological perspective. And it is so important to identify this subgroup of patients, which might be around 25% of our patients, very early during the course of illness, in order to give them the right treatment. In summary, early treatment is key to more favorable prognosis. Response to antipsychotic medications occurs early, within the first two, four weeks of treatment initiation. Early response predict later response. Early non-response predict later non-response. Early detection of refractory schizophrenia is possible. Maybe even, maybe hypothetically, even with some biological finding that we recently uh, 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 see. Clozapine appears to be superior to first generation or second generation in refractory schizophrenia. Clozapine is delayed because clinicians extend the length of trial, switch between non-clozapine antipsychotics, increase the dose, use polypharmacy of non-clozapine antipsychotics. These methods probably have no added efficacy. And first episode, First episode, patients who have not responded to initial second generation antipsychotic trials respond robustly to clozapine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ofert. Wonderful. Uh, time for a few questions, please. Given the Prevalent use of drugs amongst young people everywhere. Um, how do you, with these first episode psychosis patients, how do you reliably differentiate between true drug-induced psychosis that is not schizophrenia versus onset of schizophrenia? And how long do you treat them? And when do you stop treating the ones if you can tell the difference? Yeah. Very good question, very difficult question. I, 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 I'm asking myself this question every day in my clinical practice. Very difficult to tease apart. However, let me ask you a different question. What is the treatment of choice for substance? You mean street drugs, right? Substance-induced uh, yeah, uh, psychosis. What is the treatment of right. choice? I would say antipsychotic medications. Anyway, we should give them for a relatively long period of time especially if they are continue doing these uh, uh, drugs, we should protect their brain with antipsychotic medication. So it's definitely a different group from our patient with schizophrenia, but the treatment, at least for the first year or sometimes years, if they are continued using street drugs, would be the same, antipsychotic medication that we should optimize as well. Right, and if they don't use street drugs anymore, if they've had a good scare and they'd stop, 
Is there a safe time to take them off the antipsychotics? You know, again, this is not my expertise. I can answer, and please correct me if I'm wrong, from the textbook knowledge that around one year, if the patient is not doing any drugs, and we know for sure that he's not doing any drugs, but definitely it is a relatively long period of time that the patient should be on antipsychotics to protect the brain. Other questions, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah Bill. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in view of uh, the development of some of the new second and third generation antipsychotics like ariprazole, <clears throat> ziprazodone, and Latuda, and also the talk from Dr. Meltzer about higher doses for refractory patients, how would your algorithm change in view of those new developments? We actually changed the algorithm already based on the fact that right now, unlike uh, six or uh, eight years ago, we have more medications available. We changed our recent algorithm that we're working for the last year as follows. First of all, first no harm. So we know that the new generation, I could call them new generation, they are still second generation, but we can call them new generation because they were re recently approved here in Canada during the last year or two, are probably better because they are weight neutral and better with the metabolic effect. And the current understanding, our consensus, is to use these medications as first line prior to olanzapine, for example. We can call it here the old second generation, because of side effects. Uh, uh, but whatever the medications we are using, and of course we should mention the long-acting injectable, adherence is always a problem. We are great advocates for antipsychotics in, in uh, 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 the, this treatment modality as long-acting injectable because of the, long, uh, because of, uh, the problems with adherence. But here is the problem. And this is actually, maybe I will summarize again in one sentence the, 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 the main point in my presentation. We're not talking about the same group of patients here. Treatment response, if someone is a treatment responder, one of the 75% and down the road, Dr. Meltzer said it might be reduced and res re responders are maybe a little bit less than 75%. Whatever the percentage is, with this patient, we should think about side effects. These are valid questions. Side effects, metabolic side effects, weight gain, adherence, and so on and so forth. But this is a different game here. We are talking about those, let's say, 25% who are non-responders. And for them, of course, questions about adherence and metabolic side effects are extremely important, but... It's not as important because we have no choice, because these patients may be hypothetically present with different type of schizophrenia, quote unquote, and they will need close up. Final question, Nathan. No. Are you sure? Right. One more question? Sure, Robin. Um, I had a question. Um, actually, I was thinking more about Dr. Meltzer's talk earlier, where he talked about using ECT and lamotrigin for non-responders. So I wonder if you can comment on that. But I was also thinking, I have a kind of a unique practice. I see lots of patients who have a history of epilepsy. And I know there's a, you know, there's a psychosis model based on early onset of early um, um, having a temporal of epilepsy early on in your life. So I just wondered if, A, if you can comment on the use of those two modalities, and secondly, if there's a relationship between some underlying temporal lobe abnormality that those dr uh, treatments may be uh, helping? Uh, very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Regarding to uh, this open question of what to do, so Dr. Meltzer mentioned lamotrigine and ECT, and I mentioned if, 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 if you may uh, increase those for some cases, the bottom line is that we don't have something uh, uh, with robust results to offer this subset of patients who are non-responders to clozapine. What I said, and this is our uh, high-dose clozapine, if you may, uh, study, was maybe some, because we are so desperate here, 
and we really don't have anything to offer these patients, this subgroup of patients, so maybe hypothetically ECT might be of help, lamotrigine might be of help, or maybe optimize the dose of clozapine might be of help. Great. Well, thank you for an excellent talk over. Thanks. Appreciate it very much. Thanks.